On June 5th, 1967, jet fighters crisscrossed across the Sinai Desert from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, streaking across all the wasteland below them, searching for their enemy. You see, you're most vulnerable in the morning at dawn when this patrol was out looking. At dawn, if you're attacked, your enemy comes in from the east and the sun is behind them and it's difficult to spot them. But that morning at dawn, there was no surprise attack. So the Egyptian jet fighter pilots turned back to their bases and by 7.30, they had settled in for breakfast. To the north in Israel, at 7.14 in the morning, almost the entire Israeli Air Force took to flight. Taking off at 7.14, they flew west, very low over the Mediterranean, and then turned south. At 7.45 in the morning, with the Egyptian pilots eating their breakfast, they attacked, destroying runways, fighters, and bombers. Israeli intelligence indicated that the pilots would be back from their patrols, that the officers of the Egyptian Air Force would be in their normal commute and tangled up in traffic. And in less than two hours, 18 airfields and 300 Egyptian aircraft were destroyed. Within a few hours, the entire Jordanian Air Force would be destroyed and half the Syrian Air Force. It's amazing the damage that occurred that first five or six hours. Everything the Israelis had was in the air except for 12 fighters that were left to defend the land. And the wreckage was awful. June 5th, the improbable nation of Israel would live another day. You know, war never goes as planned. The Israeli Defense Forces underestimated the capabilities of a new Jordanian radar field that had been built. Even though the Egyptians never spotted the Israelis, the Jordanians saw them clearly, and they radioed their companions in Egypt. But the night before, the Egyptians had changed the codes, and so the message never arrived that they were under attack. In fact, when the message finally got through, the Egyptians ignored it, and their air force was destroyed. Again, war never goes as planned. And that day, another improbable event occurred. The Egyptian Deputy Supreme Commander, Abdel Hakim Amir, he's the man sitting there laughing, issued a no-fire order to the entire Egyptian air defense system. He was traveling to Sinai to meet his commanders there and didn't want to get shot down by his own forces, and so they were not allowed to fire that day. And so the Egyptian SAM-2 missile defense sites were silent until Israel destroyed them. In fact, that's Amir sitting there, the deputy supreme commander. That's Nasser to his right. And the gentlemen behind him are all the Egyptian pilots that never had a plane to fly that morning. Well, as it turns out, Amir's plane was nearly shot down by the Israelis and his companion plane was destroyed by the Israelis. Now why I say war never goes as planned was after the war, and I think there's actually a YouTube video series going this week, it describes all the different miracles that occurred during these six days. And at a debriefing afterwards, one Egyptian commander said, whenever anything went wrong, or happened unplanned, it was always in our favor, never for the Arabs. And if you read up on all the miracles, quote unquote, that happened, it's amazing. Israel faced five hostile countries that day, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and what some people don't realize, there were Iraqi troops there. And there was also help from Lebanon. All the nations surrounding Israel attacked. Their adversaries had twice the number of soldiers, three times the number of tanks, four times the number of fighter aircraft. They had some of the most sophisticated weaponry of the Soviet Union, 
while they themselves were flying old French jets. But the improbable nation of Israel would live to fight another day. In fact, they would fight for another five days. Now, this victory was not, was not improbable to Bible students. The Bible spoke of Jerusalem being back under Jewish control thousands of years ago. In fact, the exact year of 1967 was prophesied when Jerusalem would be united again. So I want to take a minute and we're going to take a little step back in history and we're going to talk about the prophet Daniel for a minute. And Daniel lived from 620 BC to about 538 before Christ. Daniel himself lived in exile. His Israel had been destroyed by the Babylonians. His country, Israel, was destroyed and left desolate. And here he is in exile, hundreds of miles away, and there was no end in sight for his exile to finish. For him or for any other Jew living in captivity, it seemed like it would never end. But see, Daniel trusted in God. Daniel knew what God's prophet Jeremiah wrote. And here's the first key. Understanding our time now involves knowing our Bibles. And here's the prophet Daniel knowing scripture, thinking about what Jeremiah had written a long time before. And Jeremiah wrote, and this whole land shall be a desolation, an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, I will make a perpetual desolation. And one more place in Jeremiah 29, 10, that was Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, I will perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And so Daniel knew Jeremiah's prophecy. He had been counting the years, and the 70 years were about to expire. The clock was winding down. What would he do? Daniel trusted in God. And then, just as Jeremiah wrote 70 years before, Babylon was conquered. Their iniquities were now being judged, according to Jeremiah. The Medes and the Persians now ruled the land. And a new king was on the scene. His name was Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus, Cyrus issued the decree that the Jews could return, inhabit their land, and rebuild it. Daniel's trust in God and in God's word was vindicated. In Ezra 1, verse 1, we read, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. You see, Ezra's looking at God's word too. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. And he allowed the Jews to return to their land. Now, in addition to all this, the simple lesson of turning to God's word, understanding the times you live in and entrusting God, Daniel prophesied another chain of events would occur that when the decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, from that time of the proclamation, another clock would start ticking. This is known as the 70 weeks prophecy. And so all that was well and good for Daniel. He read Jeremiah and Jeremiah vindicated his belief. 
And now Daniel's writing for another generation, another clock ticking to vindicate them, to put them to the test. And in this 70 weeks prophecy, and I'm just going to read the parts bolded. This is Daniel 9, 24 through 26. He says, 70 weeks are decreed upon thy, thy people and upon the holy city to anoint the most holy, that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the anointed one shall be 70 weeks, three score and two weeks. It shall be built again. The anointed one shall be cut off. The city shall be destroyed along with the sanctuary and that desolations are determined. It's a lot. And we just picked out a few phrases. Daniel says, you'll go back to the land, you'll rebuild it, you'll restore it, your Messiah will come, your Messiah will be cut off. The sanctuary, the temple that is still desolate because the command hasn't even gone forth in Daniel's day, the temple they would build would be destroyed one more because desolations were determined on it for a time frame. Well, this 70 weeks prophecy is why everybody was looking for Jesus in the first week, in the first century. In 457, under the Persian king, a decree went out that the Jews should return from captivity and rebuild the city. If you subtract 77s or 490 years and work your way forward to Christ, it comes out to 333 AD. That seems confusing. Here's a chart that'll help. In 457, the decree, I believe it was from Artaxerxes, was issued. And Daniel says, 70 weeks are determined. And in the last week, in the middle of the week, the Messiah would be cut off. And that works out to about AD 27, which actually is, cor is correct. Jesus wasn't born in the year zero. They knew Jesus was born actually a few years before because we know the date that Herod died and Herod was the one that killed the children. So you can work back and you know it was before the year zero, quote unquote, that Jesus was born. And working off of this date, you see 70 weeks being fulfilled at the lifetime of Christ. Everyone was looking for Jesus. In Galatians 4, verse 4, we read this. And think about Jeremiah's prophecy. 70 weeks, Daniel trusted in it. Jeremiah, or Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. When the time was come, 490 years had elapsed, and Jesus was born. And it's interesting, when you look in the first century, you don't find this anywhere else in the Bible. Everyone is looking for the Messiah. This is about the year maybe BC 1, what we would call the year zero, even though there's no such thing. When Jesus was born, Luke 2.25 says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He's looking for Christ. And in Luke 2.36 and 38, there was one Anna, a prophetess, and coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks unto God and spake of him of all that were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. People were looking for Jesus in the first century. And this is eight days after Jesus was born, when his parents took him to the temple to dedicate him to God. But it continues. They continue looking for Jesus up until he begins his ministry. In John 1, 41, And he findeth his brother Simeon, 
or Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which being interpreted is the Christ. Whereas Daniel referred to him as the anointed. Or John 1, 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. There's actually a lot of significance in that that we don't have time to get to. But Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne, and they knew who his parents were. And in Luke 7, 19, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Why was everybody looking for Jesus? Because like Daniel, they knew God's word. They knew Daniel's prophecy. They knew 490 years had elapsed, and it was time for the anointed one to appear in Israel. You know, the massacre of the children in Bethlehem by Herod, the not so great, is a powerful confirmation that they were looking for the Messiah in the first century. And Jesus, as Paul said to the Galatians, Jesus came at the time appointed. It was the exact moment the last grain of sand from the sand clock had fallen, and time is up, and Jesus appears. And, and one other note, and I think this confused the Jews in the first century, and sometimes it confuses us. When Jesus appeared in the first century, it wasn't about establishing a physical kingdom in, Roman, in, in Israel. It wasn't about destroying the Romans. His appearance was about turning people back to God, preparing hearts to serve the Father. There's kind of an odd incident and it illustrates this. And it's very odd. Jesus was asked to read that morning at his synagogue. And they handed him the scroll of Isaiah. And you can imagine Isaiah, one of the longer scrolls that they would have had. And he turns all the way up to Isaiah chapter 61. And he begins to read. In fact, let's read this. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, it's really a scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he sat down. It took him more time to find that passage than it did to read it. And he had barely started reading it and he sat down. It was the oddest thing. What's wrong? Why aren't you at least going to read the whole passage? Because what he read that day was his first mission, his first advent, to heal, to deliver captives, to set at liberty, to proclaim a coming kingdom. He was preparing a people to serve God. That was his first advent. And he was reading from Isaiah chapter 60. And where he stops was actually in the middle of a verse, the middle of a thought. And this is what he didn't read. Isaiah 62, in the middle of the verse, it continues to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he sits down, and the day of vengeance of our God. That would be his second advent. But to his listeners, he was there to heal to set free from sin and to turn back to God, to preach God's kingdom. What he didn't read was the day of vengeance. That would come, 
but it wasn't his first mission when he lived in the first century. So it seems very odd until we think about it. There were two roles for Christ. First as someone who would heal and then as somebody who would come and judge for the Lord. You know, a few days before Jesus' death, he gave what's called the Mount Olivet Prophecy. And on the Mount Olivet Prophecy, Jesus referred back to what we had just read in Daniel and to a few other places in Daniel. And he adds to what Daniel had wrote. Because not only did Daniel predict 70 years to Messiah, Daniel predicted things all the way to the latter days, to the end, just before the kingdom. Daniel predicted that Israel would go back into captivity. And Jesus confirms this, that the Jews would be scattered again, that Jerusalem would be ruled, trodden down by Gentiles again. And all of that was confirmed by our Lord. And you think about how remarkable it is. He's not exactly a prophet of good news, is he? Here's Daniel talking to people who are already in captivity. And what's his prophecy? They're going to return and build the temple, but the temple will be destroyed. That their Messiah will become and they'll cut them off. That they'll be scattered into all nations again until the end of days. But that's what Daniel said. And this is how Jesus comments on that. In the Mount Olivet Prophecy, Luke 21, verse 24, Jesus, building on what Daniel said, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, they shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And that was a message Jesus had always preached to the woman at the well in Samaria. All the way back in John 4, 21, he says, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. He's building on the message of Daniel. Or consider what he wrote in Mark. In Mark 13, 1 and 2. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Or in Mark 13, verse 14, But when ye see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let him that be in Judea flee to the mountains. He links all of these additional prophecies to what Daniel said. It's the same chain of events, but Jesus is adding more detail, filling in parts that are not mentioned. And what's most interesting to me is the passage in Mark where he says, let him read, he that readeth, or let him that readeth understand. And you think about that. He's saying, when you see, because we know this from the other gospels, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then run to the mountains. Well, if you didn't know that, Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies and you would think you should stay put and you would perish. But when you saw that happening, you should flee. And if people didn't quite get it, here's what actually happened. The Romans came, and I believe it was AD 68 and 69, and they surrounded Jerusalem. That's what Daniel talked about. And then they withdrew. And if you read and listened to the words of Jesus, if you trusted him, you would say it's time to leave because in AD 70 they returned and the destruction of Jerusalem was horrible. It was a life and death issue to understand God's word and follow it. 
You know, Jesus indicates two time periods when he talks about this. And it's a little subtle, but there's a separation of time. And Daniel talks about it too. And Mark 13, 23 says, but take ye heed, speaking to his audience. But in Mark 13, 24 and 26, then shall they see. It's another generation. It's somewhere down the line because it goes from talking to them to talking about they, people that are living later on. So there's two periods spoken of, and they're separated. And I believe that they he's referring to is us. If you listen to Jeremiah, you knew your salvation would come and you could return to Israel. If you listen to Daniel, you knew your Messiah was coming. And the fact that he was cut off and then raised confirms what Daniel wrote. And if you listen to Jesus, you would have saved yourself and your family by fleeing Jerusalem. And now the clock and the arrow points at us. Are we going to listen to Jesus and Daniel and take heed. You know, God's timeline is very precise. And it all focuses around Jerusalem. Solomon's temple was destroyed by Babylon on the ninth day of the month of. And Herod's temple was destroyed by the Romans on the ninth day of the month of. God's timeline is precise. And just as Jesus prophesied and confirmed by Daniel in A.D. 70, not one stone was standing on another. Israel and the Jews were scattered into all nations. In Luke 19, 43 and 44, for the time will come when your attackers will put a wall around you and come all around you and keep you in on every side and will make you level with the earth and your children with you, there will not be one stone resting on another in you because you did not see that it was your day of mercy. They ignored the signs. They ignored God's word. We're in Luke 21, 6 and 7. I, I know that might be a little harder to read. As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be? What will the sign be when these things shall come to pass? They knew to turn to God's word for the answer. So in AD 70, when the Jews were scattered into all nations, did they fade into oblivion? You would think so. Think of all the kingdoms before Christ and afterwards. That the means of destroying a nation was to separate them from their homeland and to scatter them as a people. And they would blend in with wherever they lived. Did the Jews fade into history like every other conquered people? Well, since AD 70, the Jews have been persecuted, massacred, chased, from one country to another. I did a quick tally in Jerusalem itself since AD 70 was controlled by 16 different kingdoms and nations. And during this time, it brings us right up to the Ottomans because we're gonna pause again in the history of Jerusalem. The year now is 1897 and we've covered a lot of time. We went from 500 years before Christ to Jesus to AD 70, and now we're at the time of 1897. And there's a quote I'd like to read to you. It's from Mark Twain. Mark Twain says, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Persians rose. They filled the planet with sound and splendor and, and then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greeks, the Romans followed and made a vast noise and they were gone. 
Other people have sprung up. They've held their torch high for a time. But it burned out, and they sit in twilight now and have vanished. And you're wondering what Mark Twain has to do with the Jews. In 1897, he observed this. The Jew saw them all, survived them all, and is now what he has always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert but aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? You know, this quote from Mark Twain, an American writer, confirms what Jesus said would happen, that the Jews would be preserved, confirmed what Daniel said would happen, and going all the way back to ancient history, what God promised Abraham, that his seed would always be. In Luke 21, verse 28, Jesus confirms that they will be there in the end. Luke 21, verse 28. I'll read this to you. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Jews watching at this period in time would see this happen. And he says, when you see all these signs come to pass, right above it, Jerusalem downtrodden of the Gentiles until, then pay attention because it's going to be fulfilled. And there's other verses. We could have read uh, Jeremiah 30, 10 and 11, where God said, I'll never get rid of you. The Jews were immortal, as it were, like Mark Twain said. But here's the other interesting thing. When Mark Twain observed that in 1897, another important event occurred in history. The first Zionist Congress met, and their goal was to revive the nation of Israel. And you know, within 50 years of the first Zionist conference, the Star of David was flying over Israel. You know, history sheds light on why such an improbable event would occur. And it's important to know that Great Britain had no intention of giving Palestine or even parts of it to the Jews. Instead, what the British nation offered the first Zionist Congress was Uganda in Africa. They said, well, we're not going to give you Palestine, but we have this nice piece of property in Africa we'd love you to have. And there it is. And it was actually issued as a declaration. And you never heard of it, I don't think. It's Sir Clement Hill's document. And I have highlighted a portion. Mr. Chamberlain communicated to the Marquis of Lansdale the letter which you were addressed to him on the 13th, containing the form of an agreement which Dr. Herzl proposes should be entered into between His Majesty's government and the Jewish Colonial Trust for the establishment of a Jewish settlement in East Africa. And there it is, Uganda. Herzl, who formed that first Zionist Congress, was offered property, and it was so tempting for them to take it. But when he brought it to the first Zionist Congress, it actually caused a split and a lot of turmoil until eventually it was rejected. Well, why don't we ever hear of the Clement Hill document? Why don't we ever see this? In Philadelphia right now is another document related to Jewish history, which we're going to get to. But we don't hear about the Clement Hill document to give land to the Jews in Uganda. It's because God keeps his promises. 
God promised Abraham and his seed all the land that he walked in. Israel, Palestine, it wasn't Uganda. And the finally, finally, the Zionist Congress rejected it. On August 14th, 1903, and I'm sorry, there's a little bit of history. Lord Balfour, who was the prime minister of the Tory party, was campaigning in Manchester. And while campaigning, he met another notable Jew named Heim Weissman, Dr. Heim Weissman. And this is the exact conversation that occurred between them. Balfour to Weissman, why has the Zionist party rejected Uganda? It was baffling. It was a beautiful piece of land. Mr. Balfour, said Wiseman, if you were offered Paris instead of London, would you take it? Would you take Paris instead of London? And Balfour, looking surprised, said, but, but London is ours. And Wiseman replied, Jerusalem was our own while London was still a marsh. And as improbable as it sounds, Dr. Wiseman in Manchester, England had a laboratory. And during World War I, he found a way to manufacture a key ingredient in explosives, acetone. And he could do it very cheaply. And he gave his discovery freely to the British who used it extensively in their war effort. He just handed it over to them for free use. And as payback, the British wanted to bestow some sort of honor on Dr. Heim Weissman. And he said, I don't want anything for myself, but I would like you to support the Zionist cause. And the Balfour Declaration was his reward. And that's the document sitting in Philadelphia today, if you want to see it, at the Jewish History Museum. Prime Minister Lloyd George is quoted as saying this, the Balfour Declaration was in essence a payoff for Dr. Wiseman's wartime services. And so the Balfour Declaration was issued, which promised support for a Jewish homeland, not in Uganda, but in Palestine. I found some newspapers and they made an interesting allusion. And you see, it ties it all back together nicely. When the Balfour Declaration was issued, the London Daily Chronicle said, no power so situated in regard to Palestine has used such language in the whole course of modern history. One has to go back to Cyrus for a parallel. Cyrus was the king that told the Jews in Daniel's day they could return to the land. Or the Jewish Chronicle made the same allusion. For the first time since the days of Cyrus, a great government has hailed the Jews as one among the family of nations. Referencing Cyrus returning the Jews to Israel. And so just as God moved Cyrus, to return the Jews, so God moved King George V and the British government to return the Jews to Israel yet again. And on May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. And that headline sums it up. In fact, that headline almost sums up the history of Israel from 47 and 48 till today. Zionists proclaim new state of Israel. Truman recognizes it, hopes for peace. Tel Aviv is bombed. Egypt orders an invasion. And listen to the cast of characters who invade and attack Israel in 1948. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and the Iraqis. The same nations in the Six Day War. And they fought Israel for 10 months and lost. How could a nation that has not existed in over 1,800 years be brought back to life? 
that one quote you saw, we didn't read it, described Herzl as delusional for even thinking that could happen. It seemed crazy and probable that Israel could ever be a nation, and yet it happened. Israel was born out of the dust of Palestine. And here's the key. Bible students had been looking for this. John Thomas wrote this in Elpis Israel in 1848. The restoration of Israel is the most important feature of the divine economy. It is indispensable to the setting up of the kingdom of God, for they are the kingdom, having been constituted such by the covenant in Sinai. Jesus can't return until Israel's in the land, said John Thomas in 1848. Israel must be a country. And he was correct. But in 1948, the Jews only captured half the city of Jerusalem. And you know that the Jews have always regretted that. In fact, this gentleman on, well, he's on my left, I guess your left, is a man named Uzi Narkes. And this man in 1948 actually had a foot in the door of the eastern part of Jerusalem. He was able to get in the city with the intent of capturing it, but no reinforcements came, and so Uzi had to withdraw in 48. And he said this, Uzi Narkis, chief of Israel Central Command, said that he always regretted Israel's inability to seize the West Bank in Jerusalem in 1948, and he was so close. And he saw the June War as an opportunity to rectify Israel's failure in 1948, a miraculous second chance. And so my question is, why wasn't Uzi Narkis, a general in 1948, able to capture Jerusalem? Because God said it wouldn't happen till 1967. In Daniel chapter 8, Another milestone in God's time is given, and this one is for us. You think about it. You think of all the prophecies made, fulfilled, made, fulfilled, and this one is addressed to us. In Daniel 8, 13 through 14, and your homework, if I can give you homework, is to read Daniel 8. Everything in there can be verified. You can prove it with Google. It's self-interpreting. And we're going to go through it for a minute. But in Daniel 8, 13 and 14, we're going to read, Then I heard a holy one speaking to another holy one, and said unto that one which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the continual burnt offering and the transgression that maketh desolate, notice the words picked up by Jesus, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? How long will Jerusalem be under alien hands? said the angel to the other. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. The prophecy is clear, and it interprets itself, and you need to read it. But this is what Daniel 8 is about. Daniel saw a vision of a ram butting heads with a goat. And the ram was represented in Daniel 8 as the king of the Medes and Persians, being attacked by a goat who Daniel 8 says is the king of Greece. And they're butting heads together. And when they butt heads together, when they face each other in battle, says Daniel 8, the clock starts ticking. And this is just one. You can look it up on Wikipedia or Google any of the dates. The first time that the king of Greece, Alexander the Great, met the king of the Medes and Persians, Darius the Third, was in 333 BC. And Daniel 8 says that when they meet in battle, start counting. 2,300 years. And there it is. That's straight from the internet. You can find it anywhere. And so what happens? Oops. Do the math. When you look at 23, 
hundred years from 333 BC, it's 1967. Remember, you don't count for the year zero. A quick mathematical way to figure it out is just subtract 333 from 2300, and it's 1967. Or you can do a long hand and just start counting. But from 333 to the year zero and onwards comes out exactly to 1967. What happened in 1967? It's what we started our talk with. Israel was attacked and attacked by their Arab neighbors. And in 1967, Jerusalem was captured and was no longer under alien control, no longer under Gentile control for the first time in its history. And if you do the arithmetic and add up the countries, I think there was over 22 nations that had control over Israel at one point or another, and specifically over Jerusalem. And now it's back into Jewish hands. What Daniel wrote in Daniel 8, I saw fulfilled in my lifetime. I'm old enough to have seen that. At the Battle of Issus, the clock started ticking. And what's even more important was not just looking back but Bible students were looking forward and predicting this date. For instance, a Bible published in 1816, Bagster's Bible. And in the margin, I know it's a little fuzzy, commenting on Daniel chapter 8, Bagster wrote in 1816, that is 2,300 years, which reckoned from the time Alexander invaded Asia, B.C. 331, it'll be A.D. 1966. We actually made a mistake because Daniel 8 says when they meet in battle, when the ram and the goat butt heads together. That actually happened in 333, and he also has a mathematical error. He counted the year zero as a year. But 200 years ago nearly, 150 years ago, Bagster read Daniel 8 and said this is what it means, and even though it wouldn't be for another 100 plus years, he said, this looks like 1967. Well, he said 66, when it'll be fulfilled. Here's another man. His name's uh, R. Milligan, and he wrote a book called Reason and Revelation. And he read Daniel 8. And this is in 1868. He wrote, it seems most probable, however, that this period is to be reckoned not from the rise or birth of the ram, as some writers have alleged, for he was in his full strength and vigor when Daniel first saw him. In other words, the goat and the ram were at full strength, but the time he was first attacked by the he-goat. If this assumption is warranted by the context, it fixes the beginning of this period to the spring of the year 334 BC. And consequently, it will terminate in the spring or about the middle of 1967. Over a hundred years before Daniel 8 was fulfilled, Bible students read it, understood it, and looked for it. And even though none of them knew they would live to see the end, they didn't play with the dates. They said, this is what it says. And it happened. In our lifetime, we've seen God's word fulfilled. The clock is ticking. The kingdom is coming. God's will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Why would we not pay attention to what God has written? You know, prophecy is meant for two things. One is a warning, like Milligan and John Thomas and also Bagster, they saw it, they interpreted it correctly, and they, they wrote it down for others to benefit. But it's also used to look back on, to confirm your faith, to confirm the way you're living and walking is correct. In John 14, 28, Jesus said, You have heard how I have said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father for my father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass 
that when it has come to pass, ye might believe. And so they weren't smart enough to look forward and understand it. But after it occurred, they looked back. And we read that in John 2, 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said unto them, and they believed the scriptures. You have just seen this happen. You've seen prophecy spoken of, interpreted correctly, fulfilled in our lifetime, and you can look back and see it. It's happening before our eyes. It confirms that what we understand is true, and the little bit that's left is also true. And I want to just mention one more thing quickly. Jerusalem and Zechariah is described as a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. You know, it wasn't that long ago that Donald Trump said peace in the Middle East should be an easy thing. Well, he learned very quickly it isn't, as did every other nation that has come before. Jerusalem is a burdensome stone. It's placed there in that spot, not Uganda, not New York City, but in Palestine for a reason. And I want to talk briefly about a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. And it's a horrible one, but it's a great prophecy. In Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 3, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city shall go forth in the captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. What a horrible prophecy. The Israel that everyone had been looking for that Daniel said would be established again in 2,300 years would have one great conflict remaining. And it says, And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. This is the day of judgment that Jesus did not read that day in the synagogue. This is Jesus going forth to fight against all the enemies of Israel who had come against them and destroy them. On this day, there would be no nation or people that would rescue Israel. You know, only a few years after 1967 was the Yom Kippur War, and they were rescued because of massive arms shipments from the U.S. But on this day, there's no friend, no one willing to take a chance for Israel, and all seems lost. And then the Lord returns. You know, if this much has happened already, why would we doubt the little bit that remains? It's time for us to look at our Bibles, to look for Jesus, and to turn to him. Why would not the last little bit of unfulfilled prophecy not occur? And just to close, here's a warning to us from Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Luke 21, 25, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to come to pass, as we see right now, look up, lift up your heads,
for your redemption draweth nigh.